Okay. Um, I want to start talking first about 1937. Can you describe for me the economic conditions, what they were like in 1937? Were things getting better? Was it still tough then? No. I don't think it was getting any better because there wasn't any noticeable uh, drop in the number of unemployed people uh, in the private sector. Uh, there were, the, the WPA w -P was, was still going then, and that, that took up a lot of people. But uh, I don't, it, didn't, it really didn't change, I don't think, until, uh, until uh, Hitler aid, invaded Poland. Was there, did you still see, could you see a lot of hardship around, a lot of unemployment? Yeah. Can you describe that for me? Tell me what it was like around here in those years. No, well, there was a lot of people on welfare still in 37. And uh, the cost of living remained down. Uh, you could get, food was very cheap, which was f fortunate for all of us. And uh, their, and uh, rents were very, very, still very low. And, and, Hitler was making all that noise over there in Europe. He and, uh, he and uh, uh, Mussolini in Italy, and there were a lot of people hoping that the war would come so they would get a job. Let's, uh, let's talk about the war a little bit. Tell me about how you first heard about the war, what you were, what you were learning about it, and how you told me about your friend and what he used to do with your friend, listening to the radio and stuff. Can you describe that for me again? Well, uh, I have a political uh, science background in school, and I followed that very closely. And uh, when 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 uh, uh, the fascists took over Ethiopia, I said, uh, "These guys want to fight." And then Japan was making all that noise over there in Manchuria, and uh, and uh, and then later on in China in the thirties. And I thought that there was going to be a collision one of these days. Uh, between the forces of uh, of, uh, of democracy and the, and the fascist group, I didn't know how long it was going to take. And then uh, uh, Hitler started making even more noise than anyone, and I I saw that there were many violations of the Versailles Treaty. Uh, the Germans started rearming, and uh, Hitler was making all this stress about about, about what he going to do and uh, to get back. The lost territories, and he started blaming the, the Jews and the communists for everything. So, I just wondered how long it was going to take before we actually got into a war. Tell me about uh, hearing Hitler on the radio. Did you listen to it? Too? Could you hear the news reports at all? I used to listen. To, I used to look forward to a meeting on what is Carlton Barn? Wasn't that his name? I used to love to listen to him. Good news tonight. Good news tonight. And uh. He was he was pessimistic about uh, 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 peace. Very pessimistic because uh, the League of Nations wasn't doing anything. I I heard one of my professors back in the early thirties. Uh, he called the League of Nations a debating club. He said because he looked at it, it had no police powers, and I I never forgot the, those those statements he made then. And uh, and 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 by by reading uh, uh, as many newspapers as I could get every day, and and, and uh, periodicals like the Atlantic and Harper's, and the Nation and the New Republic, uh, I sort of stayed on top of what was happening in the world. Tell me about um, you and your friend uh, listening. It seems like radio was the means a lot of people used to learn about what was going on overseas. Uh, is that what you, you did? Did you and your friend listen to radio? And Every evening I listened to the news. Uh, I think it came on early evening, and I, got, I think late at night. And, and there weren't any televisions then, too. You kept the radio on <laughs> most of the time if you wanted to get... Uh, get musical, musical or treatment or sporting events. Why, you what you went to the radio, and uh, you didn't get as much, uh, as much sporting events then as you do now, either on television and, and radio both. Because uh, I remember we used to sit up late at night to listen to. Uh, uh, I can't think of his name. He used to broadcast. 
They used to broadcast a cotton club about three nights a week in Harlem. We used to sit up on some of our parties early in the evening. We used to dance to the music of Duke Ellington over the radio live from New York City. And uh, that's what we talked about a lot, about what we heard on radio. And so when you were hearing war events, you were, you were all debating that as well? Yes, particularly when it first started. We, 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 I, I, we remained glued to the radio. Uh, I had a, a friend over in Oakland. He's a physician. He was a bachelor like I was. And we, every night we'd, we'd go someplace and turn on the radio in his car. And we'd listen to what was happening over in Europe. And we'd wonder how long will it be before we became involved. Were you scared? Was it frightening? Oh, sure. Mark. So we were talking about the war. I want you to tell me a little bit about what um, your attitude was. You said you were wondering when we might get involved. Was that something that you were afraid of, or what was the talk among your friends? I thought that I could escape, but I was, uh, when they finally did get me, I was 36 years old. Uh, but the, the emphasis all the time was on getting, uh, the cutoff age, uh, they say, was 35. And, I felt very comfortable uh, that they might pass me by. Uh, in fact, I made one of those, those gestures right after Pearl Harbor. I, I attempted to enlist because uh, uh, I know I, I was aware of the segregation in the armed forces, so I attempted to enlist because my, my preference was the Navy. But they weren't taking any enlistments then, particularly from us. Before it all started, did you think the U.S. should get involved, or? Uh, I thought we would, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, I didn't know how far, uh, and I thought it even, well, I always thought we would become involved, but because uh, the, uh, all, all the fascist states wanted to take over the world, that's where I felt. And I felt that they'd have to be stopped sometime. And, uh, and they made the mistake of thinking that, that we were so wealthy and bloated that, that we wouldn't do anything at any time. Uh, if war came, did you ever think about what kind of an impact it might have on the economy? Was there talk among your friends about that? Yeah, particularly when those uh, you know, I think about two years before, before Pearl Harbor, uh, I, 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 I think Roosevelt was aware of what, 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 what might really happen. Because, you know, they started uh, uh, enlarging uh, in the facilities over at Pearl Harbor. And uh, they started enlisting a lot of workers. And some of my friends went over to Pearl Harbor. That was two years before before the war, and and uh, they were there that morning when when the bombing took place. To work over there in the navy yard, and uh, that was an indication to me that 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 uh, that that President Roosevelt was making preparations for the possibility that we would get in there because uh, 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 he recognized that that if Britain and France both fell that uh, we might, we would be forced to get into it anyway. And uh, so I really wasn't, wasn't, wasn't surprised when it, when it did happen. Yeah, you had talked to me. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you remember about the uh, USS Panay bombing. I thought the, I thought in time, that that would uh, would would bring us into to a war against Japan. I wasn't thinking about Germany so much then, because uh, uh, I I felt maybe the Japanese didn't realize that uh, we could outproduce them in most things, and uh, and I thought they would become overly ambitious and and challenge us one of these days, and. Uh, my thinking wasn't too far off, I, uh, as subsequent events prove. And uh, 
I always felt it would be a matter of time because uh, they, they, it was being played up too much in the world, in the press all over the world. When would these dictator states stop? At what state would they stop? And your friends ever talk about what uh, what war might mean economically for blacks or for the country? Did you ever talk about that? We talked about the job possibilities. So many of us didn't have jobs. Uh, you know, slightly before the war, I think about three years before the war, they started building all these public housing projects. And, uh, you know, middle class blacks were moving to those places then because <laughs> they were they were brand new. And uh, the neighborhoods weren't, weren't quite as bad. And because uh, several of my friends moved in San Francisco and down in West Oakland, too, they moved in there. Young people who just gotten married and other people. Uh, uh, real estate was very cheap then because you could buy uh, a five room house over in Berkeley for about, oh, $1,900. It's stucco on all four sides. We have to take a break because we uh, need to put in a new camera roll right mm -hmm. now. Mm-hmm. What, um, what was your reaction to the invasion of Austria and the, the Munich Agreement that came out of that? Can you tell me about that? I personally felt that the, that the French and British should have stopped him. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. And, uh, and some people who wrote about it who were on the scene said he would have pulled back at the French army moves. And I wondered why they didn't. Did you think then that it was going to mean something for the United States? I thought in the long run it would because uh, uh, we were too busy watching the Soviet Union. So, so were the British and, and so were the French. And, uh, and I was, at, was intelligent enough to, to know that uh, they were hoping that Hitler would turn east instead of turning west. Because they, it looked like to me they were encouraging him, him. and uh, and I, I think they thought they could have bought off the Japanese. They probably, I always felt that they probably, uh, they would force the Dutch to give up the Dutch East Indies because that's what the Japanese wanted that petroleum. Tell me about um, what happened to, uh, after the invasion of Poland. What happened? What began to happen to the economy after that? Well, I think uh, Moore sh uh, Shipyard <laughs> hired more people in Bethlehem steep Shipyard here in San Francisco, and also uh, uh, I think Bethlehem had a shipyard over in Alameda, too. They started looking for more workers, and, uh, and you, you heard these things. You know that people were going to work, and uh, Mayor Island started expanding, and then they started talking about opening up Hunter's Point. There wasn't a Navy Yard out there before, before the war. And uh, you could hear about jobs, jobs. And, uh, and people started coming out here from, from, uh, from other parts of the country uh, in search of work. Of course, that hadn't stopped from the time of the Great Depression because I, I think I told you about the, the freight trains all over the country. There would be several hundred people on freight trains, whole families going about all over the United States in search of jobs. Well, that was still going on even then. Well, you're talking about the year 37 and 38. A lot of that was still going on, too. Yeah, tell me about that. What did you see about that? Well, people were, uh, you, you know, you had the great drought in the Middle West, and uh, the farming industry just practically went out of business, not only uh, in the Middle West, but in California, too, because... I remember the, I went back to school up at Chico, Chico State College in 32, and they didn't harvest the peach crops up there in the Sacramento Valley. And uh, I got on a freight train at Sacramento to go on up to Chico, and uh, we got right outside of Yuba City, all these acres and acres of peach arches. The train stopped, and these several hundred people got off the train walked over in the peach orchard and gorged themselves on peaches themselves, and then they filled their pockets of whatever they had with peaches, and, and uh, uh, they walked back over the freight train, and the conductor got out there and waved 
His hand put it freight to go, and the engine had to give two toots. Train spotted out north, headed for Oregon. So, so that kind of thing continued. I mean, all those folks. Were yes, it was still around, and uh, the uh, uh, see the farmers couldn't uh, out here. They couldn't sell their food, so they let us let us stay on the ground. I remember my 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 stepfather had a hog ranch up there in Paradise. That's a little town out of Cheek up in, in the hills there. He had about 500 hogs. He couldn't get three cents a pound for that pork. So he killed some that fall, salted a lot of it down, and get, just gave it away to neighbors around there. And, and, and we became so, so fed up with pork, we put a salt lake out there for the deer to come in there. And the deer would come there, we'd knock one over <laughs> and have venison. <laughs> for a change from the pork. <laughs> well, the, the wardens knew we would do that, but there was a guy uh, right next to us up there in the hills there. He had a still. <laughs> he, he was making whiskey. <laughs> and they knew it, but they didn't try to stop him. Interesting. Oh, and so, so these migrant um, families were also coming in, I guess. Every, everywhere. And uh, Los Angeles took the, the, the Los Angeles City, City Police now. They sent uh, uh, a contingent of officers to the up there, the California line in that in that Reno, in that Tahoe area, Truckee area, and they sent them up to the to the uh, northern borders, uh, for, for coming in from Oregon, the southern borders down in Arizona, and of course these people they call so well, all of them Okies, most of them, they'd come out in these jalopies, so they'd stop them at the at the, at the, at the state line. And ask them how much money do they have. Well, very few of them had anything much. And uh, if they didn't have $10, <laughs> they said, well, you can't come in California. Now, this wasn't the state police. This was the Los Angeles City Police doing this. Well, the governor became irritated to stop that thing because it was very unconstitutional. They couldn't get, but they got away with it for a while because I think there were more people. Uh, Los Angeles was always in search of uh, people to to surpass New York in population. So <laughs> all these work, jobless people came out there to live in in, in, in Los Angeles. But uh, 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 what do you think of that? I mean, what do you think of the whole blockade that they tried? Not what it was silly. Mm. Because um, they couldn't they couldn't get away with it. What was it everybody was so afraid of, do you think? Why were they trying to keep them out? Well, in Los Angeles, they had that big, that big, that red scare was on there. Uh, it was in existence for a long time, even before the Depression, I think. They had a regular red squad in the police department. So did you see um, any of these families yourself? Like you told me about riding in the trains. Were you seeing some of the people who were fled? Talked to a lot of them. Can you tell me about that? Well, uh, well, I'd ask some questions. Well, why did you leave home? And I got a variety of act, uh, answers, you know, about about it. Particularly, they come from agricultural areas. Uh, there wasn't any work, so we came out to California looking for work, and uh, and we don't find any here. So uh, they were all in search of jobs. I don't know why they, 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 I don't know whether they went to other states like they, like they came into California, but a lot of them came into this state. And uh, at one time, the, the railroad uh, police would throw them off the freight trains, but there were so many of them, they stopped throwing them off. It's just an overwhelming problem. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't handle it. There was just too many people. Yeah, because you said it was tough times enough for the people who were living here, it sounds like. Yeah. What were you doing in 37? Did you have work? I was working for the, uh, no. What was I doing? Oh, yes, I was working, uh, I was on the WPA. I was working at uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, for the agricultural department on the Berkeley campus. And uh, we were doing, uh, well, working in the hot houses there were uh, the plants that, that they were experimenting on and uh before that 
when I first went on the WPA, I was on the Federal Writers Project. That was about in 34. How, how important were those WPA jobs to you? Very important. Uh, can you just say that for me, the WPA jobs? Because we're not going to hear my question. So if you can tell me what you're talking about in your answer. Well, uh, like when I went on, 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 on the Writers Project, we were getting $94 a month. We were getting top pay there. And uh, I knew uh, rents were very cheap and food was cheap over there. So $94 then was the equivalent of about $500 a month now. And uh, some people live very well off of that. And uh, I did because uh, I... Uh, I gave my mother about half of what I, I was getting there to help her out, and uh, it was nice. And uh, I didn't think it was going to last long, though, because uh, the the Federal Writers Project, you know, they were the most rebellious of all, all the, the, the WPA projects because most of them are writers, playwrights, and a lot of other people. They were intellectual. They were an intellectual group compared to uh, uh, most other WPA workers, and. Uh, and a lot of them were left wingers, and uh, they formed a union. It was national in scope, and uh, they were making certain de certain demands upon the government. People on welfare making demands upon the government, but they 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 did it. And I I I don't think it lasted. Uh, not here uh, locally anyway. They cut it down the size of it. I think they only kept a, a very few people. Because when I went in there, there were. We worked on the campus of the University of California in the Bancroft Library. We started doing a, a, a research uh, on writing another history of the state of California. That's what we were doing over there. Yeah, they made a lot of cuts uh, in all the WPA programs in like 1937. Particularly in, in those, those so-called professionals. Uh, now, the people who are, are digging ditches, they didn't, there were more of them. And the cuts weren't as noticeable as they were in, in, in the professional ranks. Were there jobs for those folks to go to at that point? Hmm? Were there jobs for those people who were cut to go to? No. You just went and the guy started getting direct assistance. That's what you, if you were lucky. Okay, I just wanted to go back to what we were just talking about. What happened to people who got laid off of the WPA in 1937, 38? What did they do? They became jobless again, and they faced that problem of uh, raise, uh, making enough money to pay their rent, uh, and uh, some of those people were buying their homes over there, you know. Their monthly payments were about, weren't very, very high because the property didn't cost very much, and uh, some of them became, uh, as they, they started a, Having those house rent parties that we read, read about they had in Harlem and Chicago, where the the lady of the house would cook up a lot of lot of uh, food. That, what Maybe. you probably heard that name, soul food, <laughs> black eyed peas, red beans, cornbread, and greens, and pig feet, and all that stuff, and and have some of that bad booze in there. And they, most people had pianos in their houses too, so they they'd get somebody who who'd play the piano. They would be dancing and eating. Yeah, and, it's like uh, there was no jobs for them to go to, though, right? I yeah, mean, there wasn't any jobs. The FDR made these cuts, and I think the idea was, okay, the government's helped people for a while. We've got to cut back and see what they can do. But did it work? No, it didn't work. Um, let's start talking again about what happened when the economy did start finally picking up a little bit. We were talking about the war and uh, what happened after, say, around the invasion of Poland? Well, I think, I think the business people were happy because <laughs> uh, people who at one time didn't have any money had money now and were buying. And uh, uh, particularly uh, a lot of consumer products and, and, and the, the type of food they bought was different, more expensive than it was before when they didn't have, when they didn't have any, any job or any money. Uh, Did uh, were blacks getting jobs at first? Mm -hmm. Were blacks getting jobs at first? Not at first. 
that? Moore Shipyard st started hiring blacks, I think, around about 1937, possibly, or 38. Uh, there, was an there was an expansion as early as 37. Moore Shipyard is down in West Oakland. They hired a few blacks, and they hired many more whites because uh, well, it seemed like uh, uh, the people in, in, in that in industry sensed that, that we were probably going into a, a, a war one of these days. And, uh, and now I think that, that Bethlehem Yard over in San Francisco started adding a few more workers too. And also the, there was a Bethlehem Yard over in Alameda. They started adding on a few more workers. Uh, and I think there were plans uh, all known in Washington about what they were going to do, because it didn't it didn't seem to take them too too long before you you uh, uh, Kaiser got his his uh, his contract, and they built his first yard over there in Richmond. Was it was all this initial growth uh, benefiting blacks at all? Were blacks getting jobs? Yeah, uh -huh. but uh, not in the skilled jobs, just laborers mostly. Because the skilled jobs are uh, like machinists and and, uh, and others, skilled people, uh, uh, they were wrong to unions. And if you uh, if you go to the shipyards and ask uh, the employment office, ask for a job, they ask you for a union card. Well, if you didn't have a union card, uh, uh, they they'd say, well, we can't hire you till you get a card. So you go to the union and try to. Uh, uh, and they said, well, you don't have any job, we can't give you, we can't give you a card. So you, you face that problem like that until, uh, until FEPC became uh, an order, from a presidential order. You couldn't dis discriminate on jobs. Well, let's, let's, hold on, you're running ahead of me a little bit. I want to talk about the, um, the March on Washington. Can tell, me, tell me how that all came about and, and, and what that was. Well, it was it was so bad. I I forgot the the year. Uh, uh, it was just shortly before Pearl Harbor, I think. And uh, you know, uh, 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 Poland had been been knocked out, and, and France was about to be knocked out. And and uh, it was hard getting jobs in the shipyards and in the the, the growing uh, airplane in, industry. And uh, so the only jobs you could get was just as common laborers. If you if you had skills, like if you were skill if you were a plumber or an electrician or something, you they wouldn't give you a job. So uh, everybody became very unhappy about it, particularly uh, nationally, not only here on the West Coast. Cause, so uh, Phil Randolph was uh, he was the president of the sleeping car. A Porter's Union. Now they 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 had a, they had an international charter, but uh, uh and he and some bad Rustin and some others decide, decided uh well maybe we can prod Washington if we would stage a march on Washington because all the begging they had done and and Roosevelt wasn't paying any attention to that then because he didn't think it was a a, a, a priority. So uh, Randolph and Walter White and some others went there and had a talk with somebody in Washington, and they came away with very dissatisfied. So they they made the announcement that if uh, they didn't end job discrimination based on color, uh, they were going to bring a, a quarter of a million blacks into Washington and march down Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, when Roosevelt became convinced that they really meant it, that's when he issued that FEPC order. And of course, there were blacks from all over, the, or all of the, uh, uh, all of the states in the union who were going to go to Washington on their own expense, because there was no organization who was going to pay their way back there. But those who could afford it, of course, they could have got a, a, a quarter of a million out of out of uh, Philadelphia and, and, and Washington and New York. They're all close together. They could have got that many from those three cities. But there would have been some others from other cities too. Um. Tell me about what it felt like when, when you knew Randolph was meeting with the FDR and he was he was uh, making these demands. What did that feel like? <laughs> we were sure. You said, go to it. <laughs> did, you, did it make you feel proud? It did. Can you say that for me? 
I felt very good about what, what Randolph was doing there. And because I'd always been an admirer of the man, I, I, I know what he had he had done done in in, uh, in organized labor for blacks because he had, that was the only black union uh, union that had an international charter from the American Federation of Labor. Because when when I worked for the Southern Pacific on the dining car, we had a union also, and I joined that when I first started working with them in twenty seven. But uh, we uh, the AFL wouldn't give us a, wouldn't give us a charter. We went in as, as an auxiliary of the bartenders union. So all we did was pay dues. And, yeah. So how did word spread through the black community about what Randolph was doing? Well, uh, word of mouth, and then we had a we had a program over there in Oakland, which served well K, KWB. Uh, 15 minutes every Sunday morning, and uh, we we kept kept that before the people every Sunday. But but these things like this, uh, you know, like about the job situation, and uh, and we had meetings over there just like they didn't. I don't know what they did over here, but but we had meetings over there about this matter because. Uh, uh, you had that organization over there called the National Negro Congress, which came into being, I think, in the winter of, of uh, maybe it was 33. So this was, but this was a real important issue. It was, because the uh, unemployment picture was very bad among blacks, far worse than it was for whites. Because uh, we could easily say about, oh, about 40% of it. The blacks were out of, uh, unemployed, and the jobs you got, you know, uh, black women, females who were domestics, they were working for twenty-five dollars a month and staying on the place, sleeping, twenty-five dollars a month. I know Senator Nolan. Uh, he, he wasn't senator then, but uh, before he was elected to the California State Legislature as an assemblyman, he hired my mother as his cook and, and, and my sisters his maid. He gave them each $25 a month. They stayed, stayed on, on the place. And they only got one day off a week. And the funny part is many years later, uh, my, you know, my sister became a member of the, of the ILWU here, the, the, the warehouse workers branch. Uh -huh. And uh, there came a, a lull and she got laid off for a while after the war. So the Nolan, Mrs. Nolan came back from Washington and she was looking for, for a cook. So she went, went to uh, the employment and she applied and of course Kate had went down and found. So when she saw Kate, uh, heard about Kate, she called her. So Kate called her up and she said, oh, Catherine, I'm so glad to hear from you. And she says, what are you doing? She says, well, I don't have a job right now. And she says, well, I'm looking for a cook. She said, well, I'll come out and talk to you. So she went out there and uh, uh, I, I think uh, this was around about 1946, I think it was. And uh, she uh, got got $75 a week mm -hmm. from them to work out there. Oh, yeah? Yep. Okay. We're going to have to change roles now. Okay. I want to um, go back to talking about the March on Washington, and um, I wonder if you can tell me what did what did sort of fe seeing what the power of, of your own numbers of what all these numbers of black people could achieve what did what did that do for for the black community? I think the whole strategy on on Randolph and the other leaders' part w was to impress the president and the nation that. We had some power, although you know by by uniting, and uh, and I think the very thought of a uh, of a quarter million or perhaps more blacks walk, walk, marching on Pennsylvania Avenue frightened FDR a little bit because there are all sorts of things might have happened. You know, uh, could have gotten out of hand, and they could have been uh, oh well, people who are uh, opposed to. Uh, the democracy for all people. I, I, I mean, uh, 
equality, they might have attacked those, those people. There could have been riots on the streets. I think that's what Roosevelt was looking at. And he didn't want that to happen then. We were supposed to be the capital of democracy. And I, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, Randolph very shrewdly felt that, uh, this, uh, that, that Roosevelt would react in that manner. And I, and I think Randolph was probably correct. Did it give you a sense of power for what he'd achieved with it? Oh, we did. We, we felt it was a new day coming. That's what we thought. Uh, although deep within ourselves, we knew. We still had a long ways to go yet. But this was a victory we achieved at this time, and then people started getting jobs. That's the most important thing. And, they, uh, uh, and of course, uh, you went to work at the shipyards, but you couldn't join the unions. You had to join auxiliary unions that, like the boilermakers, they had an auxiliary boilermakers union. The blacks went into it, and uh, they uh, they had a black uh, business agents, whatever t term they use, who would co collect uh, wages and give out these auxiliary union cards to these people, and uh, they let these uh, these uh, these. Uh, black uh, business agents, if you call them that, uh, keep a certain percentage of money, although they were making more money than the workers were because you had to have a union card to work. So tell me about how you all challenged that. We went, went to courts here because uh, uh, to become, you know, first class members of the union. And uh, it went to the United States District Court. Uh, Joseph James, who was president of the NAACP then, uh, uh, led the fight. And uh, so uh, we got some good lawyers over here. I, I don't remember who they were now. And uh, I remember the first time that the, uh, the case was called in, in federal court, oh, Judge Michael Roach proceeded and the courtroom was jammed with black workers. And of course, you, you know there's not very many seats in any court. So uh, 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 Judge Roach looked up there and saw all the people. He said, let them sit in the jury seats. Yes. And so they filled up the jury seats, but they're still standees, standees in the court. And that, that, that uh, thing, that litigation went on throughout the whole four years of the war. <laughs> Why is it so important to, to all those people? Well, we still want first class, first class citizens yet if, if we couldn't, couldn't be uh, uh, first class members of the, of, of, the, of the union. And we were tired of that second class citizenship. So we, it was very important to us. As it is to us today, we're still second class citizens, I, the way I see it. Tell me what happened to, uh what happened to blacks' jobs after the war ended? Well, I think there were a lot of people, I know here in San Francisco, it could have been the same way all over the nation, I was hoping that the majority of these blacks would go back where they came from. I remember one occasion I went to, to a press uh, meeting, the mayor, uh, mayor, uh, Oh, his son is uh, the editor of the Atlantic now. What's his name? Lapham. And Roger Lapham was mayor here. He had a meeting down there, and that's the first time I met him. So he asked me, he said, Mr. Fleming, how long do you think these colored people are going to stay here? I said, Mr. Mayor, I said, you know how permanent the Golden Gate is out there? He said, yes. I said, well, the colored people are just as permanent as the Golden Gate. I said, they ain't going nowhere. I said, if you hope that, anybody else here in the city hope that. I said, they're not going any place. You see, we're already American citizens. We were born in here. We don't have to be naturalized. So when I said, these people would much rather stay here and be on welfare than go back down in the deeps in the rural south and work, work for, for 50 cents a day. I said, because they'll get more money being on welfare out here than they'll get back down in the south. So I said, you may, may as well make preparations to see, see jobs are found for them. Were, uh, did blacks uh, lose their jobs uh, early in the war? Yeah, as always. 
Tell me about that. How were blacks hired and fired during the war? Last hired, first fired. That's that's the American system. Because uh, uh, the the federal money, the spending uh, for the war industries was cut cut down. And, of course, uh, uh, blacks had a little seniority because... uh, we had an incident here, in, in, you know, the on the bridges even. Is, he was a liberal guy. Uh, uh, they, uh, there was a sort of recession, I think, uh, in the early 50s. And uh, a lot of the longshoremen wanted to let off a lot of these, these new workers that came home during the war. And most of the new workers were blacks. So uh, we went to a meeting out of Bridges' house. And the suggestion was made uh, uh, that that they would stagger the workers. Like they would work two weeks, and not, then then they'd lay off and let the others who were, didn't have jobs work two weeks. That that was the uh, plan submitted to Bridges. Well, he was pondering it, so he invited uh, Goodland and I out there from the from the Sun Reporters. Uh, so uh, Goodland told him, says, uh, "Well, this is a sensible program." He says, and I hope the, 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 the longshoremen adopt it. He says, because if you don't, he says, we're going to write editorials advising blacks that every time they have a, a strike down on the waterfront, blacks go down and be scabs. Mm-hmm. That was his answer to that. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they adopted a plan that they'd work two weeks and go off. The others who weren't working worked two weeks. All the struggles in the labor movement. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, I wonder if I can uh, ask you about uh, the internment of the Japanese during World War II. What, what do you remember about that? What was your feeling about that? Well, I wrote editorials about that, and, and I, was, I was indignant. I didn't like it. I, I felt they did it to the Japanese because they weren't white. And, and I also mentioned in my editorials that there were a lot of Germans, I mean, and Italians here. I said they weren't interning them. And then when I got in the army, I saw something that really made me furious because uh, uh, they had a lot of Italian prisoners of war that they brought over from North Af- Africa. And uh, they could go in the PX, say the big PX, but I couldn't go in there with the American soldier's uniform on. So uh, I think they, they, they picked out the Japanese because uh, 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 a, lot of, a lot of white Americans didn't, didn't think that the Japanese would have never enough to attack a white nation like that. Although they should have learned after the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 that the Japanese had a first-class army and first-class navy over there. But they didn't learn anything because they, they, they looked down on them as being inferior people. Yeah, tell me a little bit about um, how you heard about the U.S. Panay again and what your, uh, what your thought was when you heard about that. Well, I was surprised. I didn't. I I, I. 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 didn't think they would, would bomb, bomb an American warship there. But uh, looked like they were bombing ships that would happen to be in in, in, in the river there, and, and the Panay was one of the ships. Yeah, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. Were, because I. Uh, maybe I'm guilty of some of that feeling I said, why the hell about the Japanese? I didn't think the Japanese would attack a country like this. And, I, and, and you know, uh, I could understand why they would attack the Russia, because Russia was so disorganized in at that time. Uh, faced with the uh, imminence of a, of a revolution internally, and, uh, and, and the country was just very backwards, that's all. Yeah, it just seems like it... People here weren't so aware of there being a big threat of a war trip to Japan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Oh, I'm sorry, right there. I wanted to ask you about um, the San Francisco Fair. Tell me what you remember about that. Uh, I'm gonna run out. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let's just put one more in. I've got a couple more questions to ask. Yeah, I was going to ask you, tell me about the San Francisco Fair, what you like the best here, what you remember about it. Well, the thing I remember best about it, they, uh, since I'm a, 
a jazz fan and used to play saxophone was when they brought Benny Goodman and Count Basie out there <laughs> in, in the bands. I went over there to hear that. And uh, then I went by that, 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 I guess that science exhibition, they showed the, uh, that heart, how the heart would pump. And, uh, and of course, uh, the other, only other thing I went to was the Father's Berger. I went to that because I thought they had some lovely chorus girls in there. And it was good, good entertainment. So uh, I didn't do much else over there. I went over there back at least once a week while it was going. That's a lot. You were right. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the bands wouldn't stay there too long. I, I think they stayed there about two weeks. Then they'd, they'd bring another attraction in. And uh, and I enjoyed watching the jitterbugs caper out there. Uh, I, I couldn't jitterbug very well myself, but I liked to see the, the good ones dance. And uh, then uh, I went there so I could tell people that I attended it in, in, uh, in, in 1939, the first year. And uh, and uh, of course it helped me out a lot too, cause uh, uh, I got a job. Uh, that was before uh, as a red cap, and I only worked uh, uh, in the mornings and in, in the evenings. I worked the daylight going out and worked the daylight coming back, and I used to make five or five or six dollars each morning. And and then I make about four dollars in the evening. I was making ten dollars a day, which uh, wasn't bad in in thirty nine. Gave me some change because uh, uh, cause right after that I, I I went into the after that summer, I I went to work at the the WB started giving uh, uh training people for war work. You know, skilled workers. And I signed up to become a machinist. I didn't have the slight, slightest idea what a machinist did, but but I'd some of my friends who had signed up told me, "Well, just go in there and sign up." So you, you, the the the, the WP is paying us, uh, uh, I think seventy four dollars a month, and uh, so I signed up and I, I worked out at a uh, technical high school over there in Oakland, and uh, they started teaching us how to read blueprints and how to operate lathes. And, and and drill presses and all the other uh, mach machine tools that you are, are operating in a machine shop. So uh, I stayed in there until uh, Pearl Harbor. Right. So it's the fair opened again in 1940. I stayed there until till Pearl Harbor. Then when Pearl Harbor came, I heard that uh, I, that uh, the Kaiser had his first yard going out there. I, I went went out there that first first day and got a job as a scaler. I didn't know what the hell a scaler did either, but I went in there and I, I decided I didn't like being a scaler. So uh, somebody told me about, well, Mayor Allen is hiring a lot of workers up there. So I laid off from Kaiser and went up to Mayor Allen and got a job right away. So I said, well, this will be a civil service job. I said, I might be able to keep this job after the war even. That's the way I thought then. And everybody else was thinking that way, particularly if you went into one of the, the government uh, installations. And, uh, but, uh, and then I got tired of going up to Vallejo every day, so I transferred to Bethlehem over in San Francisco, and then Bethlehem and Alameda, and then uh, the Army uh, Army base over in Oakland. There were just defense jobs everywhere then. Oh, there um, were. Can I ask you to go back and talk to me a little bit more again about what we were talking about in the very beginning, about um, the tough times that there still were in 1937? I think you... I, I want you to really describe that for me about how, how people were getting along then in 37. What did it look like around here? Was it, I mean, because there are all these newsreels out there that say, oh, the Depression is over, promises ahead, prosperity's ahead, things are going to be just fine now. I don't think it was over with. From what I, my observations, uh, uh, even though. The WPA had, had made a lot of cuts, then, but there were still a lot of people on WPA, and those who weren't on WPA had no jobs. No and the thing, uh, it, uh, I didn't see any changes until uh, uh, I think uh, oh, probably about 38. I think that's when the guys went over to, uh, you started seeing some changes in 38. 
because the Navy was recruiting people, as I told you earlier, to go over to, to Mare Island. And they also decided about that time they, go, they would go open up uh, Hunters Point, too. But they weren't hiring very many at Hunters Point. So what, what really finally pulled the country out of the economic crisis? What was it like? No, what finally pulled the country out of the economic crisis? After Hitler went into uh, into Poland, it was the war, basically. Yeah, the World War II really ended the depression, and after World War II, the re depression came back for a lot of people because we still haven't solved. The pre I don't think we've ever solved the depression yet. Yeah, that's one thing I'm trying to figure out as I look at this decade. Did we really ever figure out how to solve the problems of poverty and stuff? What do you think? I think. Uh, Social Security has helped out the system a heck of a lot. There were a lot of people opposed the, uh, the Social Security, but they were glad that it was here because uh, it's been Social, uh, Social Security dollars that's helped out the economy a great deal. You talk to most, uh, I've heard uh, a number of black physicians say that. Uh, what, was it not for Social, Secu Social Security? Their income would be down a great deal. And, and I think a lot of merchants would say the same thing. We, we've talked a lot about all the, um, there was, that the 30s was a, a real era of activism and, and uh, about the March on Washington and, and that kind of thing. What, what are your thoughts about that? What do you think it, the 1930s ended up uh, achieving? Did it lay the groundwork? For it laid the groundwork for the, for the Civil Rights Movement in, in the 60s. I think it did, because see the war, Interviewing them, but in, intervening them, but I, I think blacks were moving in that direction already, because uh, uh, well, uh, the uh, the Jim Crow patterns was so obnoxious. We decided that some of us we just as soon die as to continue continue living under these 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 sort of conditions. Uh, I t I think I told you on the way over here. It was so bad uh, that a lot of young doctors, uh, particularly dentists and lawyers, when they'd finished the courses, they were grad graduating from good schools, particularly in Howard University and, and, and universities all over the country. They would work at red caps at night, and, and, and the dentists would extract teeth in the daytime. And the lawyers would do the same because they could go to court in the day, they'd work in the evenings. So if it was like this for the people who who had this training, of course there wasn't a lot of them, admittedly. If it was like this for these people who had this sort of training, what was it like for the people who didn't have any training, or very little training? It was still the same thing for them. Do you think the, that living through those tough times made people fight more or change them in other ways? For a lot of them it did. Uh, uh, and... Uh, then when you look at look at the the present situation, the the, the large am, amount of of jobless young young black males and what they're doing, look like they look like they never heard of what 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 we did to try to make things better for them. Uh, this resorting to killing one another and arming themselves heavily with guns. I I I don't understand why they do it. Did um. And no, most of those people don't don't have jobs. It, and, they, 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 and, and there's a, a lot of possibilities that they never will, will have a job in life because they were born in a in, in, in the homes uh, uh, where, for the most part, they, they, own, they own the welfare. And, and, and there are a large number of those people uh, are, are, are out in our society. And uh, uh, we have some come and work for us part-time, you know, putting the paper out there in the circulation department. They have no intention of looking for a job. One, one guy's about almost as tall, tall as, uh, as Wilt Chamberlain. I used to try to talk to him when he's in high school. I said, listen, if you finish, play basketball while you're in high school. And I says, uh, some of the colleges will grab you up and give you a scholarship. But he looked at me like I was insane to mention anything like that to him. We've got about another minute here on the camera. Do you think, how did living through those years change you personally, change your attitudes? Well, 
I started reading a lot. <laughs> I used to read the books that my father read. As soon as I learned how to read, and uh, and 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 I, uh, I guess I learned a lot by reading. I still do a lot of that. And then I was always interested in getting an education. I did it change your? Did all that that you went through change your feeling about uh, America or about uh, black people in America or anything like that? I, uh, my opinion hasn't been changed about uh, black and white in this country yet until we got to do a lot, lot better than we're doing. I, I think we've done considerable because uh, I think it's better than it was when I was a kid, and much better uh, for me than it was for my father. Mm -hmm. It's just a slow process. It is. Yeah. And it's evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, I look forward for the future being better for all of us. I hope so. If not, we're going to destroy one another. Yeah. Well, I ran out a lot of your t worked on a lot of your tapes today. That's fine. That's the, you filled us up with good stuff. <laughs> so I thank you. You're, you're a free man now. You can stand up. You can. Thank stretch, you, you very much.